Hello everyone. Welcome to part two of watercolor marker succulents uh, with Artist Loft. I'm your instructor, Adrian Hodge. And uh, last week's class was a lot of fun and we we're off to a great start with our first layers of these watercolor marker succulent studies. Um, oh, I was a little distracted by the chat there. Um, Somebody was saying they couldn't see me and I was like, oh, well, I'm pretty sure I'm on the screen. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm just going to review supplies really quickly and uh, review really quickly what we covered last week in the class and then um, we will jump right in because uh, we've got a lot more layers that we want to add to these these little painting studies, these little mixed media studies before uh, the hour is up. Uh, I did just want to mention that we have a pre, oh, I'm sorry, it's not a premium class. We have a, a really great class that is starting next week. Uh, it's a two part class on um, mapping and contouring faces. And so far we've had a number of premium classes on portrait drawing that have been um, you know, available for a small fee. And those YouTube recordings are only sent to those who registered and, um, and paid for those premium classes. But the next two classes that are coming up in this series are uh, a portrait drawing class. And it's a two part class, like I said, on mapping and contouring bases. And that class is free. So make sure that you sign up for that, especially if you've, you know, been missing out on some of those premium classes on portrait drawing and um, stay tuned for that. And then we've got a premium class at the end of the month on um, monochromatic uh, soft pastel. Um, I can't remember the exact name of it, but it's a nice monochromatic soft pastel drawing that will be very frame worthy when it's done. So um, make sure you check that one out as well. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and switch to my tabletop you here. Uh, make sure you tag your work with Make It With Michaels and Michaels Classes and follow me on Instagram at Adrian Hodge Art. And you can even tag me directly on Instagram so that I'll be sure and see your work. Or if you'd like me to see it, but you don't want to share it on Instagram, then you can always just send it to me because I love to see uh, work. I even saw some folks just recently finished their pen and ink pet portraits from a few weeks ago and tagged me in their post. And I was really happy to see that when it was completed. So even if it's an, an older um, thing that we worked on in this drawing series, I'd still love to see it. Uh, and there's a couple of my business cards with some of my ethereal work that I do on uh, using ink on paper, primarily calligraphy ink. Okay, so, um, just going to review supplies. I've got this big set of Artist Loft water, dual tip watercolor markers. I've got the 48 piece set um, with a lot of colors and we went over all of the colors that we'll be using in this, uh, this little study last week and we made a little bit of a little test palette and we tested out the watercolor markers. We did a variety of mark making with them and then saw what happened when we added the water and made them stretch. Also discovered that uh, you have to apply the water to the watercolor markers right away or else it will not do this lovely um, bleedy thing that you see here um, because I was doing several little swatches and then I let a few of these dry and then went to add water to them and they don't quite bleed as much. So if you're having trouble making them bleed, make sure that you are adding the water right after you uh, make a mark with them or pretty soon thereafter. So we did a little bit of, we did that. We tested out all the colors that we'll be using. Uh, we did some sketching in our sketchbooks using, just the artist loft sketching pencils and a sketch pad. And we talked about the contour lines and the value shapes that we're seeing on the succulent petals or, or leaves and how um, 
the various contours, how the elevation dips and changes depending on, you know, the, the part of the, the succulent that we're looking at. And it's a lot of the same repetitive shape. It's a lot of this teardrop shape or um, sort of a spade shape. We're seeing that or like a leaf shape over and over again, but some of them may dip down in the middle. And the reason that that's important to know is that when we apply the watercolor marker in a way that follows those contours, we're more likely to render something that feels you know, more realistically like the succulents. And then that gives us a lot of freedom to play with the, uh, the mixed media technique of adding water and then drawing and then, you know, kind of having a mix of drawing and painting with them. So you can be really loose. And as long as you're applying your marks in a way that follow the contours, um, even when it bleeds, it's going to still give you a sense of like, you know, that leaf is dipping down. So if you're applying the markers just sort of you know, with straight lines, it might not be as convincing as the, the subject that we're, we're trying to render there. Um, so tonight we're going to need mostly the markers and uh, the everything we were using last week, except we're not going to be drawing as much. We're going to just be painting and creating lots of layers. So we're going to need those Artist Loft uh, watercolor paintbrushes. I just realized I put my little case away, but it's this set, which was linked in the supply list, uh, the 10 piece watercolor uh, brown synthetic brushes, um, which are nice and soft and lovely. We need a water cup, we need paper towels. And uh, if you are like me and you were working at your workstation in between last week and this week, you may have peeled up your tape on your uh, on your watercolor marker succulents. Uh, so you'll want to just tape that paper back down. So I uh, used some blue tape and taped the paper down, got it nice and flush. If it, um, if you peeled it up and you want to um, tape it back down, just make sure you're kind of squeegeeing it as you go to make sure that there's not any bubbles. Um, and if you're just joining us and you missed a part one of this class and you want to just follow along uh, and check out part one uh, later, then uh, Raina can drop the link if she hasn't already to the um, class from last week. And uh, you can watch it on YouTube and then come back to this one on YouTube, which this one should be posted tomorrow, uh, usually around noon is when I see them go up on YouTube. And then they also show up on the Michaels website under fine art um, classes, previous classes there. Um, okay, so I've just retaped my uh, paper down and I just, I had a piece of tape right here that kind of sectioned off my painting area. So I just added that as well. Are there any questions about just getting reset up here to continue this piece. So we had someone ask, could the bleeding be different according to different types, of, like of brands of watercolor paper? Uh, yeah, the watercolor paper definitely um, makes a difference. Um, so I'm using, most watercolor paper is gonna be 140 pound. Um, this Artist Loft watercolor pad that I'm using is 140 pound. Here, let me just hold that up under the camera for a second. Um, so I've got the Artist Loft 12 by 18 inch, but I, I put the six by nine paper on the supply list, um, but I'm just using the bigger block. Um, so at the bottom of the watercolor paper pad that you're using, it'll say a weight. And so if you're using mixed media paper, it's not going to hold um, quite as much weight. I mean, it may say 140 pounds, but it's not going to hold water the same as watercolor paper will. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, if you're using a heavier weight paper, then the um, the water will definitely bleed when you put water media on onto the paper. Um, it definitely affects it. Good question. 
So does, does the brand of watercolor markers also impact how much it blends or bleeds? I would assume so. Um, these are the first watercolor markers I have ever used. So I must admit, um, I'm not well versed in a lot of different brands of watercolor markers, but I am very well versed with all water media. I, you know, like I said, I do a lot of work. I know I'm always just showing these two, same two paintings, it seems like on screen, but you can check out all my other work um, on Instagram or my website or um, I think Raina might have my my link tree um, to so you can see, you know, all the places where I post my work online, but I worked with gouache, watercolor, um, acrylics, um, acrylic inks, all different types of inks. Inks are definitely my uh, my go to. But I would assume that they're they're different. I mean, a lot of different brands, you know, behave differently. I kept using that word behave last week to talk about the watercolor markers. And that's a good thing to repeat um, because I know we talked about watercolor pencils last week a little bit. And I said, um, you know, these definitely behave differently than watercolor pencils. Like we can really get them to flow and and bleed a lot more than you can the watercolor pencils. So these are really fun. I'm definitely planning to do more with these in this series going forward. Okay, well, I wanna get started if there aren't any more uh, pressing questions about supplies or anything. I think we're all good. Okay, cool. Um, one other supply that was not on the supply list, but you might wanna have it handy and I'm planning to uh, use one myself during this class is a hair dryer, just because uh, we need a lot of drying time. Like this action that happened after the first layer really can't happen if you are, you know, trying to like add another layer while things are still wet. We really need to let um, let each layer dry as fully as possible. And also the very last thing that we're going to do, which I'm glad I'm saying that again, because I forgot to mention the white gel pen uh, was another thing on the supply list that I forgot to um, to list again tonight. Um, when we add that white gel pen, we need the surface to be dry. So that's another reason for the hair dryer. Uh, yeah, but we're probably not going to add quite as much water as we did to this first layer to subsequent layers. We might, but I am going to use my hair dryer. So Okay, and then the last thing I said in uh, part one as we were ending was that if anybody jumped ahead, you might, you know, get to a point in, or you may be at this point already if you jumped ahead, but as we go through this process uh, tonight, we might end up getting into a zone where things are feeling just like really awkward, where it doesn't quite look uh, as lovely as it does in these first layers. And I like to call that the teenager phase that most paintings go through. And in the teenager phase, it's very easy to get really, you know, down on yourself and be like, well, this doesn't look like a succulent anymore. I don't like this, you know, and to try to scrap it. And just don't do that. All paintings go through a phase like that. And we just have to keep pushing. That's the nature of working um, in layers is that you have to build on those layers. And we're really going to be building the layers of this, this painting. So, okay, so let's have our reference photo handy, which I just disappeared mine. Oh, it's just hiding right here. Okay, so I'm going to have my reference photo handy. That should also be on the supply list. And uh, you should have a copy of it. If you don't, I can put mine just on screen real quick for you to take a screenshot of real quick. Um, I might actually cut this extra paper I have on mine because I want to have it nice and want to have it handy the whole time. Um, did anybody jump ahead with theirs from last week and have one that they'd like to already show us? I know we had several folks last week at the end of class number one that had some really impressive starts. And I'm definitely- I'm seeing, I'm seeing Sarah's, do you want me to show it? Yeah, can you spotlight anybody? Yeah. 
And there's that. Oh, nice. Yes. Oh. Is that watercolor paper or is that, uh, it doesn't, I'm not sure if I'm seeing. Um, Marty Pound too. Oh, and, oh, wow. Look at that. Oh, that's gorgeous. I love how you really put the greens there. Oh, and more now. Hold on. Oh, yes. I remember that one too. Oh, gosh. It's lovely. And brandy. Oh, it's a picture on your phone, but that's lovely. Oh, well, yeah, because it's taped. So she's got a tape down. Smart. Okay. Smart. Very smart. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm sure everybody else is like, well, it's taped to the table. So, um, <laughs> all right, that's wonderful. Thank you guys for sharing. And yeah, another thing I wanted to mention is if you're impatient with the drying time, one of my kind of professional hacks that I always do when I'm working in my studio and um, you know it's one of the first things I tell private lesson students too is like I always work on two or three things at once I even thought about taping another piece of paper down on my uh, surface tonight so that I could kind of go back and forth between two of them but I think with the hair dryer uh, I'll be able to make the magic happen but um but yeah, working on two things at once is really great because then while you're waiting for one layer to dry, then you can work on um, the other one. And while you're waiting for that, the layer on that one to dry, you work on a different one and it really helps with, you know, it requires a lot of patience to let each layer dry naturally, or you can just work on multiple things at once. Okay, so um, I'm not going to review all of the colors. I'm just going to name the colors as I pull them back out. We talked about how we want to start with the color that we see the farthest back in the image and then work our way forward. So we used our uh, turquoise blue, which that's, well, that's the turquoise, but I'm, I need the light turquoise. That's not quite it either. I think it's this one. Okay, yeah. So we used that light turquoise blue and then we put the purple on top of it. Um, and so now I wanna look and see like what other color is in there as the same layer as the, the purple. And I'm seeing a lot of gray. So I'm gonna use my gray now to start to build some of these shadow layers up. And so I'm just looking at where I've placed this, this leaf and I'm following those contours that we talked about. So I might switch and do a little bit of like a cross hatching application with those with the gray to start to build up that layer of shadow that I'm seeing right there. And I'll do that, just kind of bounce around and do that anywhere I'm seeing a lot of gray. But I don't wanna let it sit there for too long because then it will dry up and it won't bleed, right? So I'm just gonna bounce around to a few spots where I'm seeing a shadow and start to build up a layer of shadowy gray. We're really gonna have this push and pull between the light, the dark, and the medium tones of color. And I'm kind of working from the farthest back forward on the succulents right now. And then after we do this, and we're waiting for this layer to dry, we'll work on the background, or we'll work in a different part of the, the succulent painting so that we can let this layer dry. And then if we're ready to come back to it and it's still not dry, then that's when we use the hair dryer. And if some of your drawing got a little lost, then you can just kind of put it back in with some of these colors as well. Okay, and then I'll take 
One of my small to medium round brushes and get that loaded up with some water and then start to bleed that gray into the I'm kind of scribbling with the water on my paintbrush to get it to really mix in and bleed around. And we could have even added some purple in with this gray, or we can just, you know, leave some spots dry where we plan to add the purple and then bleed them together like we would paint. on the paper when you let two different colors bleed together on the paper, we can do that with the markers as well. So there definitely are some ways that the watercolor markers are like, you know, traditional watercolor paint, but the way that they're not like traditional watercolor paint is that we can draw with them. We can Although you can use a pretty direct application of watercolor sometimes in a thin brush and definitely draw with your paintbrush. That's something that I like to do. Um, okay, so yeah, I feel like I'm already getting into a teenager phase with this one pretty quickly here. So I'm adding a dark purple and then I might go ahead and add my, oh, this is sort of my medium purple. Hey, Adrian, while you're working on that flower at the top, can you just either? Yeah, let me there see. you go. Yep. Yeah, I realized I was kind of going off screen a little there. Okay, and then I'm looking for my very fuchsia purple. That's not it. The one that's almost a little pink. Maybe I'll just use some pink. It definitely does hurt to exaggerate these colors a little bit and mixing this pink with that purple will make it the purple that I'm going for. And so you can apply the, the drawing application. Uh, you can use, you know, hatching, cross hatching, stippling. Like it doesn't have to be the same sort of marks every time. So play around with some different ways of adding these, these colors and following the contours. This is definitely one of those processes that takes some, some time, which is why I made it a two hour class. Okay, that's pretty good. Maybe I'll add a little bit more of that other purple though too, because I really want those to blend together. And leaving some space in between your marks will allow that transparent thing to happen in the way that it bleeds. Like if you're just filling in like a solid block of each color that you put down, then it, you know, it's going to fill in pretty heavy. So just adding it a little bit at a time like this, it's going to allow all these transparent layers to happen, which is kind of a, a signature thing that I do in my work. So <clears throat> it's hard for me to get away from that. I love the way that looks.
I'm also being very mindful of how I'm letting these bleed as I'm adding the water. Like if, oh, I might have waited a little too long on that one. It's not bleeding. Well, that's okay, because we definitely want some like drawn layers in here too, or I do anyway. It is a drawing class. I always like to be really pretentious when people talk about my work sometimes and say that call my paintings contemporary drawings because even when I'm painting I'm using drawing techniques like I'm using these pen and ink uh, shading techniques of hatching cross hatching stippling and scribbling that's uh, always kind of at the forefront of my mind when I'm using a paintbrush so even with paintbrush I like to call my work a drawing a lot of times especially when there's so many drawn layers to what I do it's hard to call it a painting even though I'm using a paintbrush a lot of the times in my personal work okay um so well that's super wet now so that is like I don't want to touch that it, when it looks like that and if yours gets like that where it's like the paper is super shiny and it just feels like really wet and there's maybe a bubble happening on the paper that is your the telltale sign that you need to leave that area alone because what's going to happen if you keep adding layers to it when it's doing that when it's super wet is um it's the paper will start to pill you might even get a hole in the paper it might start to look really yucky and if you feel like you've pushed it too far, um, just leave it alone because it will come back from, um, from that. I've had so, you know, many times when I thought I ruined a painting, especially with ink, because um, ink can get really yucky sometimes. And I will think I've, I've ruined it. It's, you know, it's just a total mess now. And then uh, I leave it alone and let it dry completely. And when I come back to it, it looks completely different. So um, if that's happening on yours, then that's when we move somewhere else. So let's start to build up these background layers a little bit. So I'm gonna use my uh, black and maybe my dark green and my browns right here uh, for this background. And that's also going to create some contrast and start to push what's happening on the succulents forward. So, and if you feel a little, you know, if you're having some fears about going too dark with the, the black watercolor marker, you can add it in a, with the thin side maybe and do this drawing action. I might even kind of scribble with it and then add the water really quickly and let it bleed and do a really thin layer of it first just to see how dark that will get. And then I can also take some of that uh, black as it's bleeding and move it around like we did with that first layer of turquoise last week. So you don't have to go super dark right off the bat. You can build those layers with really thin applications of these markers and, and water at first. Just keep in mind that the wetter you get it, the longer you're going to have to wait for it to dry. And even though I'm going to use the hair dryer tonight, I really prefer the way things look when they naturally dry. And when I don't use a hair dryer to let them dry, which is why I like to work on 
two things at once a lot of times um, so that you know, things can naturally dry and I'm not having to force that process with the hair dryer. And also you might just let some of these drawn layers sit there and, you know, let them be drawn layers. You don't have to mix paint into, you know, turn everything into the watercolor paint. If you do something like I just did right there and you just kind of like how that looks like a little accent area and you want to let it completely dry, that is always a nice option these are definitely not extremely realistic studies we're doing. Actually, before I bleed this area and get it all wet too, I'm going to add some brown and maybe some green. I want at least one moment where it's it's super dark and contrasted right here already. I'm using this army green, dark brown and black. And I love how I saw so many people were exaggerating their colors in different ways. If you just, you know, really like a certain color combination, don't feel like you have to match these colors exactly. There's really no rules. You can do whatever you want. And with so much repetitive imagery in, in a photograph like this, it's really easy to get kind of lost and to feel like everything is, you know, not really coming together the way that you want it to. So if that's happening with yours, decide like pretty early on, like right now, um, decide which part of the succulent, like which leaf or um, like pick like one or two leaves. Like I'm going to say this one and that one because those were the two that I kind of started off looking at. And I'm going to make those as developed as possible. I'm going to see how far I can get before the end of the class. But my goal is to at least make those two leaves in that area really pop. So that's why I'm really focusing on the background right here so that uh, the more I push the background, the more I'm going to make those two come forward. And backgrounds can very often get ignored in a lot of people's drawing and painting practices. And that's, for me, where I tend to spend a, some sometimes most of my time um, in fact, several years ago, I was primarily doing portraits. Um, I had never really done any abstract work. And then uh, I went to lunch with a friend of mine who was an abstract artist. And she suggested that I start, because I always had interesting backgrounds in all of my portraits. And she suggested that I start to develop just the backgrounds and just take the people out. And once I started doing that, I started 
selling my work <laughs> way more often because you know people love to look at portraits but they don't often want to buy them unless they commission them so I don't know I like backgrounds I always have I think it always elevates a piece and also I've taught a lot of painting classes to adults over the years um, who have ignored the backgrounds completely um, even to the point where I had a woman in a class once um, just paint this gorgeous flower and then she just painted like solid black all the way around the painting and she was very unhappy with it um, when she was done because she had just you know done all this work on the flower but then she just did this flat um, background and she didn't really think twice about it but then afterwards she was you know wishing that she had incorporated the background you know the photograph in or you know put you know something more interesting back there or blurred the colors and it really helps to ease the transitions so that was where I was kind of going with this is that um and I'm going to talk about this a lot more in a in future classes because I'm going to have a couple of classes coming up in June that are on called flower fundamentals where we're going to break down different parts of the flowers because I realized flowers are just a subject matter that a lot of people are drawn to and I was trying to isolate um, a couple of rose petals when I was planning those classes and like just you know focus on one rose petal and just draw the values on that one and I realized it's really impossible to do because the way that the rose petals overlap each other and what's happening in the background is really where, you know, as an artist, you're able to make the rose petal look like a rose petal. So it's the same thing with these succulents. Um, if you're just focusing on the succulents and you're not focusing on these transitional moments, or you're, you know, kind of focusing on the, the petals themselves, but not really the spaces in between them or the, the background, um, you know, you're missing out on an opportunity to make something a little cooler happen there. Okay, so speaking of transitions, let me build my transitions. I think it's dry enough for me to go ahead and put another layer here. So I'm going to go back in with my gray and my purple and maybe my blue a little bit first too. my turquoise blue maybe a couple of different turquoise blues here Because if I can at least show you guys how to, you know, fully develop or mostly develop one or two succulents here, one or two leaves, then it's just going to be that process everywhere or wherever you're focusing your attention. So the transitional moments are where one subject matter, you know, kind of overlaps to the next uh, part, the next layer in the background, or maybe a shadow, just those spaces in between where we tend to focus our attention. Um, and having a bit of like an implied line or a gap in between those can really help, you know, if you're creating contrast between your background and one of these leaves, then just leaving a little bit of a gap in between those colors, like what I just did when I added that background there, I just left a, the tiniest gap so that I'm giving myself space to later do something like this. I'll just go ahead and do it now. I take my white and put a little white highlight right there. Is that dry enough for me to do that yet? It is. So see if I add white in that little space that I left, how that just creates this really nice little clean edge. And you don't have to do that everywhere. In fact, if you do that everywhere, then that little um, 
you know, effect isn't as effective. It's only effective if you do it here and there. So try not to overdo it because sometimes it's really easy to get excited when you put these highlights on and be like, oh, I'm going to do that all over the place. And then it's like, oh, uh, maybe, maybe made, you know, you put too many highlights and they don't really feel like highlights anymore. So I think that needs to dry a little bit more before I do that on the other, but you can see what I mean about that little edge right there. Okay. And then I wanted to use more of my pink and purple and gray right here. So, I mean, I see when I look at this photograph, I, I feel like I'm not adding anything that I don't see right here. Like I feel this sense of like a transparent purple, pinkish purple happening here on top of the, the turquoise blue. And I feel like I see a little bit of like some gray sitting on top of that. So I'm just trying to recreate the color layers that I'm seeing on that petal. Are they petals? Are they called petals or leaves on the succulents? Does anybody know? I feel like I keep calling it both. Tell me in the comments if you know what we're supposed to call these individual. I mean, they're like petals of a flower, right? But but they're also, it's like a cactus, so I don't know. Anyway. So according to the all-knowing Google. <laughs> Thank you. Um, they are considered thickened stems or leaves. Okay. That makes more sense. Okay, I think that's pretty good. I might leave that one alone now, I say, and then I like put two more brush strokes on it. Ooh, the black is bleeding onto the See, I should have stopped. I said I was gonna leave it alone and then I kept messing with it. Okay, well, that's a good transitional moment right there. Let me bounce around and do that in some other places now too. I'm gonna just move my camera so that it really zooms in on this one area I'm focusing on. Are there any issues that anybody is running into with theirs that they wanna ask me about as we're closing in on the last 15 minutes of the class? Basically just this on repeat. We can see as far as we can get. So Michelle wants to know if water will, will bleed the white gel pen markings. Uh, yes. Yeah, so that's the last thing that I'm gonna do. Cause yeah, I did kind of just accidentally made a, a bleedy thing happen right here that I didn't mean to and then yeah, when you've got, okay, well, that's a good thing that, that I did that because then I can talk about this. This is what happens um, with a lot of inks. And so, yeah, that's interesting. This is something that doesn't always happen with watercolor. Um, but yeah, these are watercolor markers. So, um, but if, see, that layer was kind of dry and then I just accidentally got some water puddled, um, puddled up on the, the leaf and fell into that that background area that was already dry. And then when I tried to pat it with my paper towel, it just pulled it out. So if you make a mistake, if you feel like you messed a certain area up, that's kind of your like, uh, in case of emergency um, lever that you can pull is that if you really wanna take a layer out, just let it dry completely and then you can let water puddle on top of it and then pull it back out. I do that with ink all the time, but I don't recommend doing that unless you really are, are unhappy. And plus it's only gonna take the top layer off. Like I can still see the bottom layer underneath that, but at least, you know, if that had been a mistake or something I considered a mistake that I wanted to take back out, then it would be easy to, you know, fill that back in with 
something else to kind of amend it a little bit. So that is a nice, you know, way to look at it when something like that happens instead of like now I just got another opportunity to, you know, redo that layer if I wanted to, but I didn't want to redo that layer. I was actually pretty happy with that layer. So, but just using that as a teachable moment. Okay, let's see. I'll admit I'm being careful not to push my layers too far to a place where I can't bring them back in these last 10 minutes. I'm trying to just focus on this, this one area here, but I'm also kind of waiting for that area to dry a little bit. So I'm gonna move somewhere else while I do that. Are there any other questions like that? I love those kind of questions. So Barbara was wondering if we're not using the white gel pen, what other thing can we do to lighten the leaves? But I think we're just waiting until the very end to use the white gel pen, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm gonna give it like five more minutes and then see what else I can do in a few minutes here and then, or maybe two or three minutes since it's already 649. Uh, and then I'm gonna add the white. I might have to use my hair dryer. I'm also being really careful not to make it too wet before I, I do that. Um, oh, but you can use like a white chalk pastel. Um, you could use white acrylic paint if you had some and a paintbrush. Um, you could use uh, Artist Loft makes a white opaque marker. Um, which I did use a, a little bit of that here, but it was a little uh, more transparent on top of the watercolor marker. Like you can kind of see where I put it right there. And the white gel pen just uh, seemed to sit on top of the, the marker more the way that I, I needed it to or wanted it to. So that's what I went with. Okay, so now that is dry right there. And I put my background back in. So now I'm just using my black to push some of the uh, darker shadows in those transitional areas in between the leaves. And I'm using a combination of some hatching lines and stippling dots to do that. So we have someone asking, how do you know which markings to use, whether it's the dots or the lines? Um, I guess if you just don't want it to be a super thick line, like right here, I don't want to put like a really thick line. I want it to feel, um, you know, just more organic right there and not like a hard edge. And so I'm using the, the stippling lines or the stippling dots. And then the hatching lines, if I do just like some little hatching lines, you know, I'm not still not doing like a full uh, hard line around the edge there. So it just helps it be a little more light. And then I can use just a small, uh, one of these paint brushes. I'll use just my smallest brush and some water to bleed those out a little bit. And then kind of stippling with the paintbrush even too. And if it feels like it gets a little too dark, then I can move that around to a different spot. The black, uh, when you bleed it, will be nice and transparent too. And you can kind of make that do what the, gr the gray was doing as well, or what I was trying to do with the gray. So I was wondering, ballpark time frame for drying. Just really depend on how much water you use. I uh, say that one more time. 
So Ashley's wondering if there's a ballpark time frame for the drying time, or if it's really just like how much water you use. Yeah, it definitely depends how much water you use, but I mean, I would say like five to 10 minutes at least. Okay, I think that is as good as it's gonna get folks with our, our limited time, even with a second hour here. Um, I didn't wanna push it too far where I couldn't do this at the end. Okay, so now I'm gonna take my white gel pen and I'm gonna look for all these really strong highlights that I'm seeing here. So, and you can use a combination of the, the stippling dots and hatching lines as well here to build that up. And if it's wet in any place, then you'll know really quickly because the gel pen just won't show up where it's wet. But if it's dry, then you should be able to just draw right on top of it. And then the last um, thing other than adding the highlights like this is I did these little kind of sparkly dots on top. And that's a, another just kind of signature thing that I do because I do all these like spacey, dreamy things in my personal work. And I rarely create something that I don't put this kind of star splatter on. So, and I, I do it a lot in my personal work with a gel pen. So just taking the gel pen and just making like a nice little concentrated dot. And you can also usually don't recommend rubbing things with your finger, but if you add water to it, it's gonna like just wash it completely out. But if you do a little dot and then kind of rub it with your finger, it'll make it, a you know, give you a variation so that you have some that feel kind of like, especially if you do it on your darker moments, like on that black background, if it's dry enough right there. If I do one right there, like, then it really gives it a nice little contrasted pop happens and it just feels really dreamy and nice and gives it a little something extra. So that is a very nice touch to add. Yeah, this is why I suggested using the six by nine paper because on this big paper, I definitely wasn't able to fill up um, the entire sheet, but I feel like we got a nice little study happening here. Um, and I'd love to see your examples at this point. And if they're not finished, then you can always share them with me later, but I'd like to see with, where they are up until this point. There's Anybody else want to hold theirs up and get spotlighted? Oh, yes, very nice. Oh, I love how that turned out. And especially the top one is very dreamy. Oh, yes, look at that background. I'm glad we talked about that. Those are really coming forward. Let's see. Oh, another person taking a photograph. Nice. Yes. I love all those layers. Oh my goodness. That one is gorgeous. Yes. And that contrast, the black, the way that that bled is just, that's so nice. I love that one. All right. That's it. Um, well, oh, one more. Ooh, look at that. Yes, I love how you left the spaces in between all of them too. That that's another way. If you don't have the white gel pen, just leave a space, and then you can you know incorporate the highlights that way. But it looks like you added the white on top of it too. All right, let's see. Well, we've got a few more minutes. I guess I can keep um, adding to this a little bit. If you guys aren't um, don't have to go, we've got three minutes here. Um, are there any other lingering questions? I'm actually not going to do a Q&A tonight, so I usually do a little Q&A on Instagram, but. We have a few. Okay. Um, let's see. How do gel, like, how do white gel pens compare with using the Windsor White Liquid Ink and a brush for doing the dots? Oh, um, well, yeah, if you've got some Windsor & Newton White Ink 
and a paintbrush, then definitely you can you can make this happen a lot easier with that. That's my one of my favorite ways to add um, white highlights to to my personal work, and I, I've mentioned that before. Um, and they they sell this at, at Michaels, the the Windsor and Newton um, white ink. And then you use that in a paintbrush. I mentioned that in one of the previous classes because I, I didn't have my opaque white that I wanted to use. So I used that instead. Good question. But yeah, the white then, is just the easiest one <laughs> for sure. And then Kathy wants to know, can you use watercolor brush pens the same as the markers you're using right now? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, you just wouldn't, um, you know, it wouldn't be quite the same because you'd be kind of painting with every brush stroke would have, you know, water already on it. So that, that thing that I was doing where I was kind of drawing and leaving some drawn areas, but you can definitely draw with your paintbrush. I, I plan to have uh, more classes like that in, in this series where I talk about, well, um, brush pens because I am the the drawing instructor, so I got to keep it to drawing mediums, but um, I plan to have more classes on using the brush pen and we've used the brush pen a little bit for um, like the, the class on negative space. Uh, I talked about the brush pen a little bit, but I'll have some more stuff coming up and everything that I talk about with a brush pen I do the same thing with a paintbrush. So we're going to be drawing with a brush pen is going to be pretty similar to drawing with a paintbrush. Did that answer the question? I kind of just talked about. I think so. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's it's the same. You're just you've got water every time. So be mindful of that. But you can definitely still stipple. You can still make a hatching line. You can still, um, you know, kind of scribble or, you know, make a mark that feels more like a, a drawn mark. You can do that with the the brush, watercolor brush pens. The ones that have the liquid in it. That's what you're talking about, right? I assume. I believe so, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I think now it's seven o'clock. All right. Well, thank you guys for a lovely class. These were so fun. And I'm definitely planning to do uh, some more stuff with these watercolor markers going forward just because I am such a drawing slash painter and it's fun to be able to you know do both with these in these drawing classes so um it kind of opens up the you know where I, I can do some like landscape things or I was thinking about maybe a portrait sometime soon and I plan to use the watercolor pencils again too um but but yeah so stay tuned for for more watercolor markers at some point in the the near future and hopefully I'll see you guys uh, all next week for the mapping and contouring faces class. That one should be a lot of fun. It's a two-parter again. All right. Thanks, everyone, and have a great evening. Thank you. Bye.